Okay, hello everyone. This is Devin Musgrave, your host for today. Welcome to the webinar, Optimize Your Value Delivery by Quantifying Stakeholder Needs. Today's webinar is the final one in a series of five addressing how to ensure value in your software development efforts. The first was why Agile missed expectations. The second was six steps for defining product value. The third was sequence your value delivery with impact mapping. The fourth was tracking value delivery, a case study, and you can find all of these on YouTube. That was a long sentence. Today's webinar is presented by Jenny Stewart, who oversees Constructs' consulting services. Jenny has 20 years experience in process improvement, software testing, and quality assurance. Her expertise in incorporating software development best practices has helped numerous companies dramatically improve their software development and quality assurance processes. We'll have a Q&A at the end using the Q&A app inside Teams. Look for the icon with a question mark inside a word balloon and feel free to type your questions whenever you like. By the way, you can also choose the turn on live captions option here in Teams if you find that helpful. This webinar is being recorded and we'll share a link with all of you later. Thanks for joining us and take it away, Jenny. Thanks, Devin. Appreciate that. And hello to everybody. Thank you for joining today. Looking forward to giving you some tips, tricks, ideas, and practices related to understanding and quantifying your stakeholders' needs and values. So today we'll cover a few things. First, we'll talk about your stakeholder landscape. We want to make sure we find all of the relevant stakeholders. If we miss some, we're definitely going to potentially miss important needs and wants that could derail our projects. <clears throat> then we'll talk about how to dig in to what the stakeholders actually want and need before we go about quantifying it. Um, then we'll give you some techniques for quantifying value. What does it mean to take something that somebody wants and actually get that specific, measurable, clear, so that everybody understands it, has a shared understanding of it. Then we'll talk about a technique called a landing zone, which is a great way when you have multiple success criteria that you need to share for a product or a project. Landing zones is a wonderful way to describe that. And we'll close out today, as Devin was saying, with some Q&A. So do please ask questions as, it, as they come to mind as we go along. Stakeholders. Well, first of all, we care about them because they're the people who really can help us build great products, products that provide outstanding value for them. First, we need to know who they are. Uh, they're a person, a group, a thing, something that can de determine the system's degree of success or failure by having an opinion about the performance. And what do they value? They want some sort of benefit or achievement or experience or outcome or savings or profit. There's something they're going to obtain through the work that we're doing. And as we think about them and what they value, we want to think about both what does it do? This is kind of the bread and butter of a lot of conversations in software. The functions, the features, the epics, however you want to characterize it, and also how well it does that. So, for example, if I'm interested in online banking, I am definitely interested in being able to deposit a check remotely using something maybe like a camera or some way of scanning it and getting that information to the bank. I'm interested in moving money around. I probably want to pay my bills. <clears throat> but I also care about things like how fast and responsive is it? If I deposit a check and it takes four days, that's not going to be a particularly interesting piece of software for me to use. I also care about things like the security. I want to make sure that if I'm going to use this application, my bank isn't, my, my information isn't going to get hacked and other people are going to be able to access the money that I have in my accounts with the bank. So while we focus a lot about feature and function often, we also really need to think about these quality attributes, or some people will call them the non-functional requirements uh, as well, because 
<clears throat> honestly, those can sometimes be the things that seriously trip up uh, the success, the, the outcome of our products and our projects and our systems. So stakeholders, great. I've got things like user stories. This should be totally obvious. It's our customers and our users, right? Absolutely, it is. Uh, but even when we think about our customers and users, it's not always quite that simple. Um, I had a client I worked with once. They had a product owner, and the product owner had a really good understanding of the needs of the people who used the system in the U.S. market. But the project was meant to support the international market that the company actually worked in. They worked around the world. They had offices and field offices and sites all over the, the world. And that person actually didn't engage people from APAC or from Europe or from other parts of the world. And when the product was first released, it was incredibly successful in the US, but it was a complete and dismal failure in the rest of the world. They had to go through several more releases <clears throat> to bring in capabilities and things that were needed in those other markets that just weren't considered particularly important for the US market. So even with our customers and our users, we often need to think about a little bit of diversity in them. I had another client I worked with once and they were building software and had been building it for a long time for kind of the power user or the expert user. And they had a really interesting dynamic and in they hadn't hired a lot of people for quite a long time. And now they had this new collection of people who were pretty new into the organization and wanted much more of rather than a power user, let me do exactly what I want. They wanted a little bit more of a take me through the process and help me support this. And we had to actually start thinking about, well, there are power users and then there are kind of these more new users that want to use the system differently. So customers and users are definitely part of this, an important part, and we need to think through the variations that exist in the customers and the users of our system. But if we think only about these, potentially we're gonna miss some really important people. Uh, we need to think about other people, often inside of our organization or maybe outside of the organization. We may have compliance, regulatory, DevOps, finance, professional services, partners, OEMs. And depending on what we're trying to do with our project and product, some of these people can be incredibly important. Um, <clears throat> I was talking with somebody recently who talked about a project they had and they completely missed out talking to the help desk, w ended up being an incredibly important stakeholder for them. In fact, a gating stakeholder because they missed the conversations and the needs that those people had, the project actually wasn't able to be released. It had to be completely reworked before the first release was even allowed to go out the door. Now, hopefully when we miss stakeholders, it's not that drastic, but it can be. It can really set the project up for a lot of problems or can really have us work on things that maybe aren't as important if we don't understand this entire landscape. There's a lot of different ways to think about the landscape. Um, you can find a lot of different techniques. I'm gonna share with you a few. I don't have any favorites in this game. I think you should find the lens that helps you think through your stakeholder landscape. And maybe that even changes a little bit if you're in a really large organization and you're working with different project teams, maybe you need a couple things in your toolbox that you pull out. So one of the lenses is just types of needs. So we have users and customers, and they typically want functionality or capability that solves their problems <clears throat> or enables their day-to-day -day work to be easy and error-free. If we're in an organization with regulatory, they're gonna care a lot about how we created that functionality for our users and customers. Did we do it in a way that's compliant? Did we do it in a way where we can show that we're compliant? Um, a systems engineering group might really care if, say, we're the software organization, really care that we're doing our piece along with the firmware and the hardware teams that brings all the pieces together to meet those value statements across a whole system or a whole solution that involves multiple different kinds of parts. So this can be a nice way of just mapping it out and thinking of different kinds of needs. 
Another way that people will think about this is tiers of system stakeholders. There's the direct users, the people who actually have hands on keyboards and do things day in and day out. If I've got expense management software, I'm going to be one of those people who is submitting um, bills and receipts. Well, back in the day when I used to travel from all the travel that I did, and I want to be able to get reimbursed for what I did. And there's then other people who are maybe working with the results. There's perhaps a CFO who wants to see the information of the expenses across my entire organization and how that is being spent against the, the P&L. So they don't necessarily directly interact with the system itself on a day-to-day -day basis, but they work with the results. Maybe they receive reports out of it, query into it, that kind of thing. <clears throat> and then a third degree are the people who install, deploy, support. They enable this to actually exist in our marketplace and, um, and be robust in terms of the solution that it provides. So we really want to optimize our value delivery by understanding our complete stakeholder landscape. It's not uncommon to have a dozen or a couple dozen stakeholders in that whole landscape. <clears throat> I want to understand all of those um, because I want to make sure that I know everybody that's out there, even though I'm likely to have a preferred set of stakeholders. There's often a set of one to three who are kind of the favored stakeholders. That may be true across the life cycle of a whole product, or it may be true one release is really focused on one or two key stakeholders and meeting their needs, and then the next project moves to another one or two key stakeholders and meets their needs. So the duration of this can shift depending on the kind of work that you're doing. But I want to make sure that I understand all of that so I'm not surprised and certainly so that I'm not doing things that aren't really for the overall benefit of the product that we're kind of building. And this is another model. Here we have clients. They're the people who provide us with resources, probably money for our project. We have customers. These are the people who can accept or reject the work we do. Yes, you can release this product. No, this isn't going in. Uh, users, the people who are actually using it directly or indirectly. Other, sometimes that's internal. It's the people inside the organization who have a real stake in what we're trying to do. So let's make sure we understand all of that. Once we do, it should be super simple, right? We just go talk to them and uh, we know who they are. We understand what we want. We just get a whole bunch of features and epics and pop that in a product backlog and off we go and we're good. Not so fast. <laughs> this is actually the really important and tricky part because people come to us and they come to us with their solutions. They come to us with what they think will solve their problems. So I'm not gonna walk in and tell you what my goal is or what my underlining problem is. I'm gonna say something like, I want a button on my steering wheel to change the radio stations. I want a tab showing me all the drugs a, a patient is currently taking. Insert probably any of your requirements here. And we want to take a step back. And instead of just saying, yep, got it, let's put that in a product backlog, this isn't value yet. Uh, as my colleague Earl Beatty likes to say, we have solutions here. We're in the solution space. We're not in the problem space. We need to back people away from what it is they are asking us for. Or a better way of saying that is we need to be deeply curious. I really want to understand why people want this. What is it that they're trying to accomplish? Five whys is a great technique here where you ask why up to five times. And maybe somebody says, well, it's not really about a button on my steering wheel when I get into the why do you want a button. What it really is, is it's about being able to access a wide variety of music while I'm driving without being distracted. So I want to be able to, say, listen to new music within 20 seconds without taking my eyes off the road. Okay, I could solve that with a button on my steering wheel. I could solve that in other ways. Now that I understand what you're really trying to accomplish, it opens the door 
to a deeper discussion about what the possible solutions are that we want to have. So here we really want to start thinking about what is the system benefit recognized by the stakeholder? When I work with people, I like to say the great thing is I get to be deeply curious or I get to be a little bit like a two-year-old. Well, why is that? What is it you want from that? What are you trying to accomplish with that? And because I'm a consultant, they'll usually answer it and we can really dig in and start to figure out these kinds of things. And I think that in our own products, in our own projects, we should have that deep curiosity as well. Um, one client we work with found that when they started talking about the core functions of their systems and they started to really dig in, understand what the system benefit was or the success criteria were, <clears throat> and then moved into quantifying it, they reduced the requirements they had for their product from 800 to 60 because they were no longer trying to really design the product or describe all the features and functionalities in it. Instead, they were describing the key benefits that it was gonna provide to the stakeholders. And they ended up using a lot of Likert scales for satisfaction to really quantify this. Um, and it was great because they were being able to focus on a much smaller set. And then they also opened up a lot of flexibility in the solution space to be able to have more dialogue between the product management organization and the technical organization of different ways they could possibly accomplish things. With another client, we found that quantifying stakeholder values just started an entirely different conversation about what the product was. The development team started to ask different questions. They started to gain a new understanding of what was really wanted and desired. And in fact, they basically drastically reduced the work in a couple of big features that they were working on because in better understanding the value, they realized they didn't need most of what they'd been thinking about building because it wasn't actually going to provide the value that people wanted and needed. So it can be a little tempting, I think, sometimes to try and stip, skip this step. But before we quantify, let's make sure that we're not looking at a solution and trying to quantify that. Let's look and say, what benefit, what outcome, what value is somebody actually going to get out of this system? And then move into the step of quantifying that. So on that, let's talk about ways to quantify it. So we want to start with first understanding that system benefit or strategic outcome or value that you're going to be measuring. Then we want to talk about a scale and a meter. So our scale of measure is used to determine kind of what we're trying to measure. So scale, for example, might be kilometers per hour or miles per hour. And our meter is how are we gonna place ourselves on that scale? So our meter might be a speedometer in the, that particular example. Um, or if we're doing something where we're looking at page load time, perhaps we have a scale that's in seconds. Uh, maybe we're doing it old school and our meter is gonna be a stopwatch from point A to point B, or maybe we've instrumented the system. And so we can actually get a report of page load time uh, from daily usage. And we can look at that to, to measure how well our page load time is. So we want to understand what's the measure, what are the units, and then how are we actually going to place ourselves on that scale? Once we know that, we want to start thinking about what's the range of acceptable outcomes? It's very rare in anything that there's just a single point, a tipping point. It's success on one side of that tipping point and it's failure on the other side of that tipping point. Almost always there's a range of acceptable outcomes. Uh, this work comes from uh, Tom Gilb and his uh, competitive engineering uh, target ranges. It's a wonderful way to say, it's not about one answer, it's about a range of outcomes from a minimum. We have to at least hit a minimum. And that's the level where we're going to avoid political failure, financial failure, or sometimes it's just the level above which we have basically just thrown money out the door. So we have to get to at least here. Then we'll have a target. And a target is a level of good success. 
where we're going to be really happy. The target's what we're aiming for, hence target. At the top end, outstanding. This is a feasible goal that could be accomplished. It's likely kind of be accomplished if everything kind of goes perfectly, uh, but it's feasible and we'd have a big party some cake, some champagne or ice cream or something to, to celebrate that, wow, we just really knocked this one out of the park. And then sometimes we may use something called a wish and it's a desirable level of achievement that may not be attainable. And it's certainly the level above which I just don't want you to invest anything more, right? If we can get to my wish, there's no more money I want to spend going above that. If my paid load time is starting to get down into the picoseconds, I really don't care. That's way past what the human eye can perceive. We've gone way past what I could ever wish for in terms of how fast something loads. So, we might have a goal related to site stability and our scale here would be average system uptime. Uh, a meter could be a, a weekly uptime report or maybe we have daily uptime reports. And then we have a, a minimum of 92%, our target is 95 and outstanding would be 98. So now we have a nicely quantified goal that we can all understand and it gives us a range in which we can operate. As long as we stay above the minimum, we're okay. If we are starting to go above outstanding, we probably wanna go ask if anybody wants us to spend any more money on getting this goal uh, available in this particular project. Um, but as long as we stay in this range, we can steer our project towards a successful outcome. So a couple examples here. I had a client I was working with once and they had this giant list in their product backlog and they weren't really sure how to go about prioritizing that giant list. He just wasn't sure which of the things in here is going to be most meaningful and most beneficial. So sitting there over a cup of coffee in India, uh, we started talking about, well, what do the stakeholders really want out of the current project that you're working on? And it was all about gaining more traction inside the organization to actively use the system. So we started talking about, okay, it sounds like one of the things they really wanna do is increase the application usage. How are you gonna know that? So in this particular case, it was about, well, we often have people who will wait to use the system until they're basically all the way through um, the opportunity stage. Uh, well past that and into actually being able to close a deal. This was an internal customer relationship management system. Um, so what we really think we'd want to see is the number of unique users who are creating opportunities because that will tell us they're starting to use the system from a very early phase versus basically using it as a, as a reporting tool rather than a customer management relationship tool. And then they had uh, a usage statistic report they could run monthly. So that became the meter that we would use against that. The other thing we started talking a fair amount about was the fact that, well, why do we think that they aren't really using it today? And they said, well, the customers aren't incredibly satisfied with it. We already have some data that shows they're not really satisfied with it. So we want to move the needle on that. We want people to be more happy with it. We think that will help increase the application usage. Plus we just would really like people to actually like the system more than they do today. And they had a, a quarterly user satisfaction survey. It was really short, like two or three questions at most that they would send out. And one of the things in there was a net promoter score. So as we started to talk through that, one of the things they had today was uh, a benchmark on the application usage. They said it's 65%. And we said for this particular project, you know, if we can't get that at least to 70%, up 5% from where we are today, it's basically just flushing money down the drain. We'd really like to get it to 75% and we'd have a party if we could get it to 85%. And with the user satisfaction, it was a min target outstanding of uh, six, seven, and eight for the customer satisfaction. And uh, they were getting fives today. And so if 
we didn't move the needle, if it was still a five when we were done with this project, that would be considered our failure range. Uh, another example can be found in a white paper by Ryan Shriver. He talks about a nonprofit that wanted to increase market share, increase monetary donations, and increase the amount of volunteer time that people donated. Uh, it was a charity that basically supported other charities um, along the way. So their scale and the market share was their market share percentage of online giving. And there was a published quarterly report that they could use um, with the monetary donations. It was the total dollars donated to nonprofits using their site and they needed to create a, a custom report. They didn't have a report to check on this today. So in order to know whether or not they were achieving the goals, they needed to build a report so they could see where they were today. And then as you start to actually implement the features and functionalities in the system, one of the things you want to do is check along the way. We make a lot of assumptions. If we build this, that will make people happy. We don't often close the loop on that and make sure we built it. Did it move the needle? And these measurable values are perfect for that kind of thing. You can be doing this preferably even within your projects before your releases, or maybe you're in a DevOps world where you've got lots of quick feedback so that you can put something out the door and see if it moves the needle in the ways that you expect it. And if it does, great, continue along. If it doesn't, maybe we take a step back and look at a different assumption. And they had a similar need in the volunteer time donations where they needed to create a custom report so that they could be measuring as they went along with the work that they were doing. So we have our scale, we have our meter, and now we need to just start talking about what is that target range of acceptability for each of those. You'll notice in both of these cases, we had more than one objective. There was more than one measure of success for our product or our project. That's incredibly common. It's really rare to say there's one thing and one thing only. Generally, there's a handful of criteria that really define success. And here we want to think about a landing zone. And we can thank Eric Simmons and his work at Intel for landing zones um, on an aircraft carrier, a landing zone describes the section of the deck that a pilot must touch down on to land safely. And similarly, a landing zone for a product describes the measurable attributes that you must deliver to achieve product vision. And there shouldn't be 50 of these. A lot of the work that Eric was doing on giant projects really came down to like a, a dozen of key attributes that defined success. So what does a landing zone look like? It's a table that has a region of success. We have rows on the tables that talk about those attributes, uh, what defines success or failure for the project. And when we have columns that are typically in that landing zone area that talk about a minimum, a target, and a net standing for each of those. And we add those in until we get something that looks, for example, here we have a landing zone for an economy car. And we're talking about, well, in the measure of economy, what are we thinking about there? We're thinking about price and we're thinking about mileage. And underneath each of these is going to be that scale and that meter as well. So how will we know what we're looking at? So for the um, price we're looking at, you know, if it's more than 25, that's going to be a failure in our marketplace. We're trying for 20, and it'd be outstanding if we could get to 17.5. And the other attributes we're thinking about here are comfort. Well, what does comfort mean for us? Uh, here it's defined as how noisy is the car when I'm driving it. Um, we might also be thinking about how comfortable is the car to sit in. I remember really wanting to have a Jeep as one of my very first cars until I actually drove it and it was noisy and it was uncomfortable and I was commuting 45 minutes to an hour each way each day. I got a different car. <laughs> um, performance and style. So these are the 
attributes that we're thinking about. And for each of these, we have a target range and the target range is described in an overall landing zone for what it means to be able to deliver our economy car into our marketplace and be successful or not. But now we really understand that in a quantified way. Uh, another example might be somebody who's looking at increasing their quarterly revenue, increasing their customer satisfaction score, and adding new monthly uh, users in probably support of that revenue goal. And what does it mean for this particular project or release to be successful in this particular area? Honestly, I always find the quantification piece of it ends up not being incredibly hard once we know the value and we've talked through the scale and the meter. That tends to be the really hard part. How will we know? How are we actually going to measure this? How are we, what's the scale going to be? And how are we going to place ourselves on that scale? So, in summary, step number one understand the diversity of your stakeholder landscape so that you don't miss somebody who's really important and important to the success of the project, the system or the solution that you're building. Step number two, go beyond what people ask for and understand the benefit or the outcome that they're really looking for. Be deeply curious, ask why, get to the real need behind the solution that people universally come to us with. Quantify the needs and benefits to make it clear and unambiguous to everybody who is part of what we're doing inside the team who's building the solution and the people that we're building it for. And then capture your top six to 12 success criteria in a landing zone that gives people a really good understanding of what success looks like, but also gives them some room to operate. Rather than saying it's a binary outcome, it needs to be exactly this, what is the range of flexibility they have to successfully land that project on that aircraft carrier so that everybody in the organization can be happy? Once we have all of this, Great. Now we really are set up for things like Scrum, XP, Kanban, Agile approach of your desire, non-Agile approach of your desire. We have a really good foundation for that product backlog, and now we can just start to do that execution piece using those wonderful techniques that are available to us. I joke all the time that the biggest thing I see in Scrum is the backlog. It's not necessarily really telling us what the most important things are. It may be full of a lot of stuff, but we don't understand the vision. We don't understand the success criteria. All of this gives people a lot of clarification and allows us both to make sure that the product backlog that we're using to deliver is very much ordered in value. And also with things like scales and meters allows us that opportunity to look as we go. Maybe at the end of every single sprint, we can start to collect data that says, yes, we are indeed starting to see the value that we want to see. The ultimate goal here is that the end of every two week sprint in Scrum or the end of every time we release something in Kanban, we can really see that yes or no, we're starting to make progress towards those goals and that value that people wanted from the, the system, the product or the solution that we're building. Devin, before we go into resources, did we want to do a little Q&A? Yes, and I just wanted to say thank you for giving us permission to act like two-year-olds <laughs> at some point in the process. That's that's fun. Why? We, <laughs> uh, we have a small handful of questions, yeah. Um, you mentioned early on in the presentation that value includes both the function and the quality or the how well aspect. Can you use the idea of quantification for the how well elements? Please, yes, absolutely. In fact, it's a great place for it. Um, it's one of the places I have initially started using target ranges because it just is so natural here. When you're looking at something like 
performance? Is it okay at half a second? Is it okay at one second? Is it okay at three seconds? Or early in my career, I remember getting requirements that were like, it must be fast. I don't, I don't know what fast is. I can't test fast. How do I know that fast is fast? How fast is too fast? Um, so uh, you can absolutely do that. Uh, for example, maybe we are looking at something like page load time with 10,000 or 100,000 concurrent users. Um, we have a meter, perhaps, of uh, we're going to use a stopwatch on the home page and we're going to uh, be looking at the number of seconds it takes to load, or perhaps there's a report on page load time that we get. And then we set our min target outstanding based on what success looks like for us. Cool. This next one is a, a, a one to many question, I think. Um, it says, you, you talked about establishing a set of benefits or objectives for a project and quantifying those. Can you also use these techniques for a request from a single stakeholder? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, so this one was based a little bit more on stakeholder value and often with stakeholders, it's looking across a diverse set and gathering a, a collection um, that kind of unifies the needs across all of those people to provide the greatest value across the organization. But sometimes a request will come in from one stakeholder. Maybe our VP of operations wants to make the system easier to use and they're thinking about the average time it takes for an employee to complete an order. We're going to measure that by the measurements obtained on a random set of 100 orders. Uh, we need that to be, our minimum is it shouldn't take any more than seven minutes, our targets five minutes, and it'd be outstanding if people could, on average, place an order in, in three minutes, and that's from one person. Um, so, and sometimes I've seen people actually quantify a number of individual stakeholder values and then bring that together in the development of a landing zone so that different people's needs are understood and quantified. And then we're talking about, well, what is that handful that we're going to use in our landing zone that really defines success across this diversity of stakeholders? I guess that gets into preferred stakeholders again somewhere. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yep. Got it. Um, and what about something like security? Our team has a requirement to implement encryption. <laughs> Your team has a solution request to implement encryption. <laughs> and honestly, this is almost always how they start. When I'm having these conversations with people, we're universally starting from a solution. So likely you're being asked to implement something like 128 bit or 256 bit encryption that's a solution it's not user value so we start the conversation about well why do we want to be doing that likelihood is there's some sort of risk we're trying to avoid this is probably something about hacked systems or needing to make sure people's information is secure or maybe it's about making sure that we don't have stolen credit cards that sort of thing and we're going to end up with an open-ended discussion that gets us back to something that's really about the value maybe it's we're trying to avoid unauthorized accesses so we end up with something like the number of unauthorized accesses per um, 100 million connections with with a target of one or wherever we end up but it's about that journey of saying okay yep i i know that's i know that's probably important why is that important? How would we really know? And by the way, this kind of thing, you might end up finding, okay, well, yeah, we do need 128-bit encryption or 256-bit encryption. And while we're at the conversation, if that's really what you're trying to do, we also need to make sure we do the following things as well, too. So sometimes in backing away from a solution and understanding that real need, you might find that you unearth additional things that are going to be requirements that you need to do or in some of the examples we talked about you find things that you're planning to do that end up not being important both of those typically happen yeah there there it is again the power of why and and yep. i 
I hope this word hasn't become empty to all of us, but <laughs> it not why the, the next word it it seems like this is empowering, right? For the dev yep. team. I mean, they're learning, they're getting to the bottom of things, right? Rather than just accepting solutions and proceeding, right? And I also think if you approach it, I joke, I'm a two year old, but I actually approach it by really wanting to actively understand why people are doing what they're doing. So I think by being aesthetically interested, that goes yep. a long ways. Yeah, you've you've used the term curious multiple times. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. Well, that was our final question. Um, Jenny has some some links here to other resources that we offer, and I'll just say that you know the first four in this series are already on YouTube, and Jenny's or today's webinar will be up there by a week from today. Thanks so much, Jenny. And awesome. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. And thank you all for joining us. We'll see you again in May, we hope. Uh, take care, everyone.